Welcome to the second chapter of our read-through of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I'm Jem, the reader at St John the Baptist Parish Church in Beeston, and this is the second chapter, What Lucy Found There. If you haven't heard the first chapter, I'd advise going to the first episode and listening to that, but on the assumption that you are up to date, here we begin the discussion of what Lucy found when she went into the magical land of Narnia, uh, her tea with the fawn, and the way in which we might trace literary and religious allusions and echoes in Lewis's work. So if you haven't yet read chapter two, go and read it. Uh, read from, Good evening, said Lucy, but the form was so busy picking up its parcels that at first it did not reply. And read all the way to... It was still raining and she could hear the voices of the others in the passage. I'm here, she shouted. I'm here. I've come back. I'm all right. So, as I said in the first episode, what I'll be doing here is discussing things that particularly jumped out at me or struck me uh, as I read this chapter. Um, this is not the first time I've read the book, um, but I'm always uh, intrigued by new things that come out of Lewis's work, new details, uh, new nuances or images that I haven't noticed before. Um, and I mentioned uh, at the end of last episode that I was going to save discussing the image of the fawn to the beginning of this one. So, delving into the end of chapter one, here we have a description of him. He was only a little taller than Lucy herself, and he carried over his head an umbrella, white with snow. From the waist upwards he was like a man, but his legs were shaped like a goat's, the hair on them was glossy black, and instead of feet he had goat's hooves. He also had a tail, but Lucy did not notice this at first, because it was so neatly caught up over the arm that held the umbrella, so as to keep it from trailing in the snow. He had a red woolen muffler round his neck, and his skin was rather reddish too. He had a strange but pleasant little face, with a short pointed beard and curly hair, and out of the hair there stuck two horns, one on each side of his forehead. One of his hands, as I have said, held the umbrella, in the other arm he carried several brown paper parcels. What with the parcels in the snow, it looked just as if he'd been doing his Christmas shopping. He was a fawn. Now obviously this is a very odd person for Lucy to meet in a, in a forest, even in an apparently enchanted forest, and various critics and scholars have advanced theories as to what's going on here. The figure that Tumnus reminds me most of all, certainly when we first meet him, is the figure of the god Pan, the classical god of woods and forests and wild places. And I think this is likely because Pan uh, haunts the imagination of uh, English creative writers in this period rather strangely. As Ronald Hutton has pointed out in his scholarly work, Pan's not a hugely important classical god for Greek and Roman writers, but he becomes strangely significant as a, as a symbol of wildness and of ancient power um, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and simply looking around at the, the writers who surrounded Lewis in, in time and genre, we can see this. So the, the short story uh, writer and novelist Hector Hugh Munro who wrote really mordant uh, and witty short stories under the name Saki in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. He wrote at least one short story I can think of that involves the god Pan suddenly appearing in uh, mid-century England. Um, we might also look at The Wind to the Willows, which famously has a very strange chapter in the centre called The Pipe Put at the Gates of Dawn, where the otter child gets lost, but they have to go and look for him, and they find him asleep by a figure playing the panpipes that appears to be Pan, the, the titular piper at the gates of dawn, from whom Pink Floyd borrowed the phrase. Even since I cited Dorothy L. Sayers in the last episode, there's an episode in a, in a Sayers novel, The uh, Murder Must Advertise, where the, the spoilt uh, little rich girl, Diane de Momery, is lured away from her party by what turns out to be Lord Peter Whimsey, dressed as a harlequin under the title of Death Breeden, who lures her to a wood and plays uh, a flute and lectures her about the fact that there is a, a kind of peer, fear called panic fear, which afflicts people in, in woods and wild places, and this is what she's currently experiencing. So even in, in Thayer's detection novels, there seems to be this, this tinge, this idea of the, of the god Pan in the background. Now, obviously, this, this is slightly surprising for a novel which is famous for being about the Christian religion rather than any other religion. And it's tempting to speculate why we have this image here. The, I won't go into great sort of theological detail here, but certainly my instinct here is that 
Pan is at the centre of those other stories. Uh, Pan is sort of the, the final thing people find. He's the the truth or the wildness or the, the power in the story. Here, an image of what looks like the god Pan is actually at the beginning. It's something that people go through in order to find uh, the real meaning in things. Uh, and I wonder whether there's there's not perhaps a deliberate choice there, but an instinct of Lewis that an interest in the English countryside and folktale and legend is splendid and, and wonderful and can lead to great spiritual insight, but it, it is not itself that insight. It should be gone through. Um, but that's just, just a speculation based upon the, the position of the episode in the novel. So Lucy meets Mr Tumnus, <clears throat> pardon me, and another thing I'd, I'd like to pick up on, which perhaps is the dominant uh, mood or the dominant atmosphere of this chapter for me, the dominant theme, is that Lucy goes through the wardrobe into this magical land, and where we might expect lots of descriptions of what the land's like and what happens there and lots of exposition to happen to her, in fact, the first thing that happens, and it happens all the way through the chapter, is that Lucy's identity is questioned and that she's encouraged and we're encouraged to see her in a new light. And it seems to be more about explaining who she is rather than these extraordinary creature uh, in extraordinary places that she comes across. So when she meets the fawn, good evening, good evening, said the fawn. Excuse me, I don't want to be inquisitive, but should I be right in thinking that you are a daughter of Eve? My name's Lucy, said she, not quite understanding him. But you are, forgive me, you are what they call a girl, said the fawn. Of course I'm a girl, said Lucy. You are, in fact, human. Of course I'm human, said Lucy, still a little puzzled. To be sure, to be sure, said the form. How stupid of me. But I've never seen a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve before. I am delighted. Now, as I say, it, it seems striking to me that the first thing that we get here is not an elaboration of the world that Lucy's entered, but a reflection back on her. We might compare this with something like... Uh, the Harry Potter novels, another richly realised fantasy that obviously came somewhat later in literary history, in which as soon as Harry gets into the, the wizarding world, there are pages and pages of uh, detailed description which, which a lot of readers find very charming and very absorbing as to how things work in the wizarding world, uh, how things are different from our world, what sort of food people eat, how they travel up and down staircases, how doors work. Um, you know, and in later novels we get details like how the Ministry of Magic works and how the, the bureaucracy and the money works, all this kind of thing. And this is not what happens here. The novel seems to be, as I say, interrogating the identity of the character that we see it through. So rather than us discovering about the, the hierarchies or the royal family of this world, she is addressed as if she's from some great noble line. Uh, but should I be right in thinking that you're a daughter of Eve? And then it says, you, you are what they call a girl. You are, in fact, human. Three different ways of classifying Lucy. That she's a girl rather than a boy. That she, she's, a, she's a character in a children's story. That she is human rather than animal or vegetable or mineral, I suppose. <laughs> that she is part of a, a biological way of, of classifying things. And that she's a daughter of Eve. That she is part of the biblical narrative, that she is at, at the end of something very old and very ancient and uh, very complex. I spoke in the previous episode about that's how one of the sort of dominant feelings of this book is discovering that what appear to you to be ordinary things are in fact uh, part of a, a much larger story. So here again, we have a hint to Lucy, if she's smart enough to pick it up, or to the reader if they're smart enough to pick it up, that what seems normal to her is extraordinary, remarkable, ancient, and part of an ongoing and important story. But this gets picked up, actually, um, in a lovely detail, and I, I, uh, I always smile at when I come across uh, it in this, in this chapter, where she's invited to Tumnus's uh, cave for tea, and she finds books on the shelves. Lucy looked at these while he was setting out the tea things. They had titles like The Life and Letters of Silenus, or Nymphs and Their Ways, or Men, Monks and Gamekeepers, A Study in Popular Legend, or Is Man a Myth? Now, from one point of view, obviously, this is a, a gentle parody uh, of the sort of books that might be found on the shelves of Lewis and his friends. Uh, well, this is a worldly wise fawn who is interested in legend and in uh, historical biography uh, and in literary culture. <clears throat> Pardon me. 
But also, there is another kind of inversion here, another kind of, of drama where Lucy is becoming the subject of scrutiny rather than the fantastical world she's wandered into, because these two books, Men, Monks and Gamekeepers, A Study in Popular Legend, or Is Man a Myth, are, of course, exactly the sort of books that you might find in our world called things like nymphs and fauns and sprites, the fairies in popular uh, popular culture, or are there such things as ghosts? You know, the, the sort of paperbacks you might find on the shelf of an enthusiast of either folklore and legend or perhaps UFOs and the paranormal these days. Except we, the ones who are reading the book, are the subject of this uh, investigation. We're the ones being called into question, so we're the ones being doubted whether we actually exist. Um, and this is... I think part, a deep part of Lewis's approach both to fiction and his approach to religion, the sense that ser searching for God, searching for um, faith, is an experience that may feel as if we're setting out to look for something, as if we're seeking something in the universe, as if we are the, the spectating subject that's going to pin down some object of knowledge. And in fact, we find ourselves being questioned. We find ourselves being the, the subject of the quest, so to speak, and we find ourselves being uh, exposed to view and called into question. We find ourselves being the object of scrutiny rather than the subject of it. Now, as I say, I don't think there's some allegory going on here or some specific symbol, but the general feeling, the general tone of this chapter seems to me congruent with the way Lewis approached faith uh, and approached knowledge. Now, whilst Lucy's reading these book titles, Tubbness is getting tea ready. And we have a loving description of the tea that they had. And really, it was a wonderful tea. There was a nice brown egg, lightly boiled for each of them, and then sardines on toast, and then buttered toast, and then toast with honey, and then a sugar-topped cake. And when Lucy was tired of eating, the fawn began to talk. He had wonderful tales to tell of life in the forest. He told about the midnight dances and how the nymphs who lived in the wells and the dryads who lived in the trees came out to dance with the fawns about long hunting parties with the milk-white stag, remember that stag from last episode, with the milk-white stag who could give you wishes if you caught him, about feasting and treasure-seeking with the wild red dwarves in deep mines and caverns far beneath the forest floor, and about how summer, when the woods were green and old Silenus on his fat donkey would come to visit them, and sometimes Bacchus himself, and then the streams would run with wine instead of water, and the whole forest would give it up itself to jollification for weeks on end. And I've just turned a page there, given that that's such a long run-on sentence. I think that's deliberate, that the sentence itself sort of picks you up and carries you with its, its many, many clauses, uh, as Lucy is being taken in by these extraordinary stories that, that Tumnus is telling. Here I think we have an image of conviviality, an image of comfort and uh, wholesomeness. And it's interesting that it centres for uh, Lewis around a meal, as it does for, for many other fictional writers. You can imagine the, the banquets in Beowulf or in Tolkien, perhaps, the... Uh, the meals that are taken with the elves at the last uh, homely house. And obviously, uh, as well as that, there is storytelling. Here we have an example of a good meal. In, in a subsequent chapter, we're going to see an example of a bad meal. We might pause longer on that, but it's worth noting here that it's shared. They both have an egg. There's food for both of them. They both partake in it. Uh, and it comes with storytelling. It comes with a remembrance of things that are important and which are going to be passed on. Uh, it, it, things that are not evident in the world as Lucy and Thomas are currently experiencing it, but things that are strong and deep and fundamental. Now, even as I'm saying this, you can probably see that there's a, a comparison there, perhaps with the religious life of Lewis himself. Lewis loved stories and legends and sagas, and he also had a devotion to the Eucharist, to Holy Communion, uh, another deeply important shared meal where stories are told, where we're, we're made aware of the great narrative that we are swept up in. Um, and things, stories are told which make things visible which would otherwise not be visible in the mundane world around us. It does, does other things, but I think that's a, certainly one function of the, the liturgy of the Eucharist. Again, I'm not suggesting that he's, he's written a Eucharistic scene in here, but that certain elements in Lewis's imagination of what a, a good meal is like and what a good meal does are tinged with his religious practice. However, of course, this wonderful storytelling is also serving another end. Uh, it can be corrupted because Tumnus is, in fact, keeping her there in the hopes that he will lull her to sleep 
um, and then he'll turn her over to the White Witch as he then confesses. As a moment later she asks, Mr Tumnus, whatever is the matter? For the fawn's brown eyes had filled with tears and then the tears began trickling down its cheeks and soon they were running off the end of its nose and at last it's covered its face with its hands and began to howl. Da -da -da -da. She gives him a, a handkerchief and even when Lucy went over and put her arms around him and lent him a handkerchief, he did not stop. He merely took the handkerchief and kept on using it, wringing it out with both hands whenever it got too wet to be any more use, so that presently Lucy was standing in a damp patch. I think he's had that off Lewis Carroll, by the way. I, th I think there's a um, an Alice echo there, because Alice also has a, a scene where there's a, an animal crying and crying, and gradually she gets... Uh, where she's standing gets wetter and wetter, and indeed she she gets sort of submerged in tears. Here, I think there's a little a little children's literature reference going on. But more crucially, I think Lucy is offered an opportunity to recognise herself in narrative, which she initially fails and and then succeeds. So um, she says, "What's wrong?" And Thomas says, "Oh, uh, I'm a terribly bad fawn. I do these terrible things." Um, uh, and he said, would you believe I'm the sort of fawn to meet a poor innocent child in the wood, one that had never done me any harm and pretend to be friendly with it, and invite it home to my cave, all for the sake of lulling it to sleep and then handing it over to the white witch? No, said Lucy, I'm sure you wouldn't do anything of the sort. But I have, said the fawn. Well, said Lucy rather slowly, for she wanted to be truthful and yet not be too hard on him. Well, that was pretty bad. But you're so sorry for it that I'm sure you will never do it again. Daughter of Eve, don't you understand, said the fawn, it isn't something I have done. I'm doing it now this very moment. What do you mean, cried Lucy, turning very white. You are the child, said Tumnus. I had orders from the White Witch, etc., etc. Now, that you are the child pings my memory very strongly. And here's a, um, a passage which we might put next to it. From the second book of Samuel, chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveller unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But he took the poor man's lamb, and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, a man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Now this is part of the, the famous narrative in which King David is rebuked for his sins by uh, the prophet, uh, and is is shown that in the story that he's so angry about, he's actually the, the, the aggressor and the... Um, the, uh, the criminal rather than the victim uh, or the sufferer. And here, we obviously, we have a rather different story in that Lucy is the victim, but we have a very similar phrase there, you are the child, thou art the man. And apart from moving the plot forward, which I think it does rather well, I think there's something here in which Lucy is being encouraged to first question her own identity when she's asked, you know, are you a daughter of Eve, are you a girl, are you a human, etc., to place herself in a particular kind of, of context or story. And then a story is told to her in which she doesn't yet recognise who she is, but then she's encouraged to recognise who she is. And, of course, this has immediate concern for her because she suddenly realises she's sitting in the parlour of a man who has fed her food and lulled her to sleep and then says, well, I'm actually I'm a kidnapper by trade. Um, it's a it, it's skipped over relatively lightly, but Lucy sort of turning white and saying, what do you mean, I think, is a recognition that there's real peril underlying this story. A children's writer like Antonia Forrest perhaps go into this in, in more detail um, and with more sort of emotional trauma. Um, but she has, after all, wandered off with a, a goatee old man um, from the woods and she's been led away. But, yeah, so, so Lucy comes to recognise herself in the story and... This links up, I think, with the idea that that appears with the titles at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of the chapter, where she's offered these titles like "Are you a daughter of Eve? Are you a girl? A human?" Um, she is encouraged to recognise herself in a particular narrative, and I think the same is happening for the reader, because after all, the reader, whether a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve, is also those glorious and high-sounding titles that appear at the beginning of the chapter, and they are reading a story about someone 
in a magical world, experiencing strange things, who themselves is then encouraged to identify themselves with a character in the story and to recognise their true identity, which I think reflects on us, that we are then encouraged to, to wonder whether we might recognise ourselves in this story. And it's relatively early on in the, in the book uh, yet, but I think Lewis's narrative here is either, we might say, teaching us how to read this book, teaching us that there may be moments in it where we should look into the story and find ourselves and think, you know, thou art the man, you are the, the boy, you are the girl, etc. Um, or we might say it's offering us opportunities for that kind of identification. Either way, at this relatively early stage, I think the book is presenting this, this m wonderful, magical world, but keeping wrong footing us, keeping suggesting that there is something wonderful and magical about the mundane world that Lucy is supposedly leaving and going towards because people in this world seem to be terribly impressed and excited about it, and also suggesting that we might start to look for ourselves in these great, long, magical and ancient stories and wonder what we might find out about ourselves and about the story that's, that's sweeping us up. So those are the things that occurred to me whilst reading chapter two. I'd be very interested to hear about what occurred to you and what struck you. So do please leave, uh, leave comments. Next time we'll be looking at chapter three, Edmund and the Wardrobe. So your reading is from Lucy ran out of the empty room into the passage and found the other three. It's all right, she repeated, I've come back. And you read all the way to, please your majesty, said Edmund, I don't know what you mean. I'm at school, or at least I was. It's the holidays now. I look forward to seeing you next time.